Chapter 2 of The Black Extended Family, The Dominant Male Figure. The dominant family picture resides at and controls the extended family base household. He or she is central to the continual existence of the family network. We ask the dominant family figure of each family in our study how a person came to assume that role. Some said that they had achieved their position because they were the one of the oldest family members. Others said it happened because their families over the years grew into extended families and they remained the head of the family. Still others said that they had inherited the position from parents and other relatives who had leaving the family with no one else to turn to for leadership. All of them maintained that they had assumed leadership because their families had come to depend on them, both in crisis situations and in day-to-day -day efforts to survive. Others in our study maintained that persons became dominant in the family because of all they had done for the family, or because the family could not have done without them, or because they had kept the family together. The dominant family figures we found are the most respected members of the families. They had proved their capacity to lead the family through the hard times and not so hard times. They had many personal sacrifices on behalf of family members. Their concern for the survival and maintenance of the family is beyond question and, for the most part, without challenge. In nearly all the extended families we observed, the dominant figure was elderly, often the oldest member of the family network. All but three were women who, like Millie Roman, had become sole leader after their husband's death. Responsibilities of the dominant family figure. Dominant family figures, figures direct many joint family activities, reunions, barbecues, and Christmas and other holiday festivities, and so forth. Help regulate the moral behavior of the family members, especially children living in the base household. Help socialize the children, define what constitutes deviant behavior, help arbitrate family conflicts, pass down family history, and pass on the black heritage. For example, teach the young how life was for earlier generations of black people when they were coming up. Teach them spirituals, how to prepare soul dishes, and techniques for survival. Among their most important responsibilities are helping family members develop a sense of family that is closeness to, love for, and concern about their kin. Helping to keep the lines of communication open between family members and helping to allocate scarce family resources among needy family members. Fostering a sense of family involves encouraging family members to feel some obligation to the relatives. It involves helping all members to feel that they are not alone in the world, that their relatives care for them, that they have roots, and that no matter what their condition or situation is, they are always welcome at home. Dominant family figures are constantly imploring family members to stand up for one another to stand by one another and to remember that blood is thicker than water. In order to keep the lines of communication between family members, dominant figures often find themselves responsible for informing other members of the whereabouts and conditions of relatives throughout the network. They commonly encourage family members to write to or at least keep in touch with one another. We found that most of the family mail coming into the base household is addressed to the dominant family figure. 
Even family members who seldom write are the relatives usually keep in close contact with the dominant figure, who, in turn, keeps them informed of family affairs. The dominant figure often has knowledge of the most intimate aspects of the lives of many family members. He or she may never reveal some family secrets it would be a mistake to see the dominant family figure as a type of dictator, controlling and mingling at all, at will, in the affairs of other family members. The heads of sub-extended families, not the dominant family figures, are the chief managers of their own families. They depend on the dominant figure for advice, for guidance, for moral support, communication with other members, and indeed, for material assistance. The dominant figure exercises most authority in the base household. It is there that he or she has dominion, even to the extent of ousting family members who challenge the authority. It is from being made a party to the burdens and concerns of the family that the dominant figure largely derives his or her power, because family members usually, though not always, welcome the guidance of the dominant figure. Coercion is seldom necessary. The aged family as dominant family figure, excuse me, the aged female as dominant family figure. E. Franklin Frazier many years ago, referred to the family grandparent as the guardian of the generation. The dominant figures we observed were commonly females, ranging in age from 60 to 85, who were great-grandparents. The extended family, however, should not be viewed as a matriarchal structure. The simple fact is that most of the aged families, excuse me, most of the aged females had outlived their husbands. Further, the roles females play may give an outsider the impression that they are running the family. In an ongoing extended family, a female is more apt to be chosen as a sub-dominant family figure and thus accede to the leadership. Seven of the nine dominant family figures in Rivertown County, Missouri were aged females. Most had outlived her husband, excuse me, each had outlived their husband, excuse me again, each had outlived her husband by a number of years. By 1976, Millie Roman had outlived Leonard by 18 years. Lily Lou Marshall, who outlived Rennie by more than 15 years. And Mona Tyler had outlived Jonah by more than 30 years. At one point in Rivertown County, there were three aged dominant female figures and one middle-aged sub-dominant female figure, all widowed, living side by side on the same street. They jokingly referred to the street as Widow Street. Widowed dominant figures in our study generally cited overwork as the main cause of their husband's death. They held that retirement was just an empty word for their husbands. Since many of them died before reaching retirement age, or never worked at a single place long enough to receive retirement benefits, farms, factories, in other workplaces had inadequate retirement plans or none at all. Even if they did reach retirement age, most of them had to continue working anyway, just to make ends meet. When alive, their husbands were either absolute dominant family figures or shared the role with their wives. When the role was shared the responsibilities of the husband and of the wife were not the same. The major duty of the husband was to maintain steady work, help provide for the family, 
regulate the moral behavior of family members and whip things back into line when they got out of control. He served as a stabilizer in an extended family. The major responsibilities of the female dominant figure while her husband was alive were of a domestic nature, though most of the women served as providers as well. Their duties included teaching family members how to cook, how to care for and raise children, how to handle money, how to deal with one's spouse, and so forth. The female figure served primarily as an organizer in the extended family. The organizer is closer to the family and the home, whereas the stabilizer is closer to the outside world and to the workplace. Because the role of organizer provides her with a great range of responsibilities within the family and brings her in closer contact with the day-to-day -day lives of family members. An organizer is more likely to be the subdominant figure. However, the role of organizer is not more important than the stabilizer. The stabilizer faces greater uncertainty because he must gain some mastery over the outside environment. Many of the aged dominant figures we talked to experience a deep sense of worth as heads of their families. Since they must tackle a number of problems beyond their toes, make quick and far-reaching decisions, they have no time, as one of them put it, to grow old interest in contrast to in Rivertown County was provided by four single aged female blacks who were not members of an extended family. Their lives were characterized by loneliness and a desire to be a part of the family. <coughs> aged dominant figures have a sense of fulfillment because they are needed by members of the extended family. Their lives revolve around family members, and the lives of all family members revolve around theirs. They are respected. Few family members would dare to be disrespectful to them, and they have a permanent place in the family. It is taboo even to think of displacing them, leaving them alone, or putting them in a nursing home. Many consider that their greatest accomplishment was helping to raise children in the family. All of those in our study had raised or had helped to raise their own children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren, and few of them helped to raise their great-great-grandchildren. Despite much, excuse me, when a dominant figure dies, the extended family suffers its greatest loss. Some family members speak of deceased dominant figures as if they were still alive, a mild form of ancestor worship. Despite much personal fulfillment, aged dominant figures often lead rough, taxing lives. They need insight into forces which threaten to hurt, break, or defeat family members. They have to deal with those family members who cause undue strain on the family. For example, Lily Roman and Mona Tyler were, both, both of them complained that some members of their family took advantage of their goodness by sending too many children to live with them, or by coming to visit only when they needed money, or by demanding an unfair share of the limited goods and services available at the base household. Others confessed that they were too old and too sick to take care of any more babies or other dependent family members. Others expressed concern that there was no one else in the family who would be strong enough or willing to keep the family together when they died. So in that sense, they felt they were forced to go on living for the family's sake, as one of them put it. Transfer of dominance. Having 
To take a lesser role within the extended family is not easy for some aged dominant family figures. Some may feel slighted when they see family members encroaching upon their turf. Others, however, consider it a blessing. Even after repeated war warnings from her physician to slow down the pace she had taken all her life, and particularly to stop caring for more of her family's children, Millie Roman was afraid that if she followed that advice, her family would suffer. No matter whether dominant family figures were sick, old, or tired, they want to feel useful to their family. And when family members insist that they take it away, it is usually in order to prolong their lives, not to push them into the background. Against the time when the dominant figure dies or can no longer serve as a leader, most extended families groom a family member to take over the leadership function in the extended family. The takeover by this subdominant figure usually comes as no surprise to other family members. Yet the transfer of dominance is not planned. There is no family transfer. There is no family conference or search committee. Members are not usually aware that the transfer has taken place because the total process is so natural. Even if the dominant figures, figure die, <coughs> dies quite unexpectedly, Family members usually take it for granted that a family member will encourage to fill his or her shoes. The subdominant figure is often a woman, often the dominant figure's oldest daughter, who, over a period of time, has been groomed by her mother for her mother's role. In extended families where dominance is shared by a married couple, the husband does die first, the widow becomes the sole dominant figure, while some other men in the family help to fill the stabilizing role. If the wife dies first, the subdominant figure, usually a female, shares the dominant position with the widower. When both husband and wife die, the subdominant figure, usually a female, takes over as head, sole head of the extended family with men in the family serving as stabilizers. The subdominant figure and the dominant figure have not necessarily shared a household or even lived near one another. Most of those we talked to had attempted at one time or another to live away from the base household. Betty Bronson, for example, had left Rivertown County where she had been raised and moved to Kansas City. There, for five years, she tried but failed to make her way. She ended up with four children and no husband. Having trouble making it economically in the city, Betty had to send all of her youngest children to live with their grandparents at the base household. Several times she came home to stay herself in order to survive. But after a few months, she was back in the city again. At the age of 28, pregnant again and still with no man, she decided to return permanently to her hometown. She has long since given up dreams of becoming a singer and settling down in a nice home with a good man. Now she had resigned herself to a life revolving around her children and her extended family. When she first moved back to Rivertown County, she and her children stayed in the base household. Betty helped her mother carry out many responsibilities of the dominant family figure, and by doing so became the subdominant family figure. After a few months, however, Betty was able to make a down payment on a home of her own. When her father died, Betty and her children moved back into the extended family base household. With the help of one of her brothers, Betty took over the stabilizer role left vacant by her father's death. A few years later, her mother died. And Betty, age 34, living at the base household, consisting of six rooms and an outdoor toilet with her five children, 
two brothers, three sisters, three nieces, one nephew, and one cousin, naturally, without planning or protest, became the dominant figure of the Bronson extended family. Like Betty, other subdominant figures in our study started with no plans of assuming family leadership. Once they had oriented their lives around their families, however, and had come to be depended on by family members, the role as subdominant figure was almost a certainty. The subdominant figure, we found, works closely with the do dominant family female figure. I repeat, the dominant the subdominant figure, we found, works closely with the dominant female figure, grappling with routine family problems. In so doing, she gains the respect of the older woman. Like her, she learns to make personal sacrifices for the sake of family survival and togetherness. She quickly becomes almost identical to the dominant figure, accepting her lot naturally. One interesting observation about the subdominant figures in our study was that once elevated to that role, they tend to have more, no more children of their own, or at least fewer than other females in their families. This may be explained by the fact that with limited resources, they have become responsible for caring not only for their own children, but for those of family members as well. Dual Dominance Betty Bronson took full charge of the extended family when her parents died. The Tyler extended family, however, was carried on a system of dual dominance since the death of Mona Tyler's husband many years ago. Mona had depended on her oldest daughter, Laura, to share the role of keeping the family together. Family members feel free to bring their problems to either Mona or Laura, or to, or to them both. The children in the family have come to fear Laura more than they do Mona. Mona would use verbal means to bring about order, whereas Laura, as one family member put it, would beat the stuffings out of you. Laura well, has informally adopted her, into her own home two of her sister's children and one child of a niece. When Laura's husband died in the late 1950s, she began to play a more active role in her extended family. Now that Mona is constantly ill, she has turned over most of the family responsibilities to Laura. Should Mona die first, Laura will naturally become the sole dominant figure in the Tyler family. Struggle for dominance. Things are very different among the Romans, where there is a three-way struggle for dominance or say so. Because there is no clear idea of who the sub-dominant figure is in this large but tightly knit extended family, that position is being vied for by Paul, Millie's oldest son, Mary, Millie's youngest daughter, and Karen, one of Millie's grandchildren. It is unlikely that Paul, 57 years old, can take over the role. Although he has a close relationship with Millie, most of the other adult family members consider him an outsider. Paul has trouble communicating with many extended family members because he tries to be boss. He contributes little to and receives nothing from the base household and the sub-extended families because he believes members should stand on their own. He has cut himself off from all family activity except, perhaps, to attend the family funeral, to attend the funeral of a family member. Many relatives accuse him of having feelings of superiority because he is economically independent. He seeks say-so in an extended family, but his views are more consistent with a nuclear family system. The major obstacle to Paul's becoming subdominant figure is that he is the instigator of many family arguments. He demands that the parents of the children living in their base household take complete responsibility for their offspring. And he insists that adult family members stop defending 
depending on Millie for financial support. One family battle ensued when he tried to get Millie to put out two of her grandsons, both in their 20s, on the grounds that they were lazy, would never work or amount to anything as long as they were being provided for. Paul's philosophy of individualism and his nuclear family values have caused most family members to dislike him. Although Mary is skilled in cooking, cleaning, and caring for the sick, and although she, her husband, and their children live only a few blocks away from Mary, her emergence as a subdominant figure is unlikely also. Mary's family lives beyond its means and constantly must depend on Millie and other family members for assistance. More than once, Millie had had to mortgage her home to get Mary out of debt. Yet family members appreciate Mary's efforts while Millie is sick, even though they sometimes question whether her motive is not to ensure Millie's contribution. Con Yet family members appreciate Mary's efforts when Millie is sick, even though they sometimes question whether her motive is not to ensure Millie's con con continuing economic support. Others complain that Mary makes no attempt to teach her children to, be, to have proper respect for Millie. Karen and her two, two children live with Millie. Karen is responsible for preparing meals, cleaning house, and caring for the children living at the base household. She often works side by side with Millie. Despite this, a few family members accuse her of allowing too many of the domestic duties to fall on Millie's shoulders. They also feel that Karen is financially able to move into her own place with her children, and by doing so, it's doing so to relieve Millie of the responsibility of caring for them. Still, most of the relatives appreciate her devotion to Millie and to the extended family. She is the most likely candidate for the subdominant role, but will not assume it without a struggle. Male subdominance. It is usual for a man to be groomed for the role of dominant family figure. An illustration, an illustration is provided by Bully of the Marshall Extended Family. At the age of two, Bully was informally adopted by his grandmother, Lily Lou, when his mother died. Lily, the dominant family figure, had six remaining daughters and had taken in a number of their children at one time or another. But because all of her daughters lived in Kansas City, and are occupied with their sub-extended families, but Bully was groomed to perform both the stabilizer role generally allotted to men in the extended family as well as the organizer role generally allotted to women. Bully learned to take care of the other informally adopted children, to cook and to do the laundry, marketing, and other domestic chores. He also provided a portion of the family income by working in a factory <clears throat> and at odd jobs. Since Lily received little aid from her daughters and had to assist all but two of them financially, Bully's salary was needed to supplement the public welfare grant and the old age pension Lily received. The fact that Bully had only a slight interest in females added to his value in the extended family. <clears throat> For Bully to dedicate his life to a wife and children of his own while serving as a sub-dominant or eventually dominant figure would have been difficult. Despite Bully's special grooming for the family leadership, Lily's only son, Leroy, attempted to gain more authority in the family by constantly challenging Bully. On several occasions, he sought to resolve their differences by fisticuffs. However, 39-year-old Leroy was reluctant to help the family financially. He was unable to perform the domestic responsibilities of organizer. His drinking habits disturbed Lily, 
and even the children in the family showed him little respect. All of this made it unlikely that he would ever take over a bully's role. The fact that neighbors were of the opinion that Leroy was a nuttier than a fruitcake did little to further his case. <clears throat> the young dominant family figure. Subdominant family figures seldom take over full leadership before they are in their late 20s or early 30s. However, there is a young person living within the household of the dominant figure, and there are no family members outside the base household who are more capable or more willing than the other person to take over. It is possible that he or she may become the head. This is what happened to 18-year-old Clara, who took over the Finney family when her mother died unexpectedly. Family members at first saw Clara's role as a temporary one, but until an older family member could take charge. But as Clara increasingly provide, proved her ability to deal with extended family matters, she began to be accepted as dominant figure. Today, in her early 30s, Clara is unchallenged in her role. Most commonly, young dominant figures began as key figures in sub-extended families which separated from the family base to form a new extended family. Brenda Benson was the oldest daughter in a sub-extended family connected to the Roman family base. She lived with her husband and father and her nine brothers and sisters. When Brenda's mother was killed in a car accident, family members were opposed to plans by public welfare officials to place the children in foster homes. But neither the base household nor the sub-extended families were financially able to absorb all of the children. Brenda's father was considered too unstable emotionally to raise nine children. Finally, Brenda, aged 19, stepped forward and said she would care for her brother, her brothers and sisters. Brenda thus became head of her sub-extended family. Her brothers and sisters began to have children of their own. The Bensons will probably form their own extended family with Brenda as the dominant figure. Young persons who step into the role of dominant family figure receive fewer benefits than older family members. Their role is often thrust upon them due to some tragedy in the family. They can no longer pursue a free life of their own. Brenda Benson, for example, will probably remain with her family until all of the adults become physically, emotionally, and financially independent, which means that she may be tied to her family forever. Her chances of, for marriage are slim, for few men want to take on the responsibility of a large, ready-made family. Brenda's fiancé canceled marriage plans shortly after she took over as head of her sub-extended family. Thus, the general pattern for young family heads like Brenda is to settle for a series of boyfriends who flee when the relationship seems to be progressing toward marriage. If she could get, if she should marry, if, if she should get married, the strain of maintaining a husband and children along with the dependent members and an extended family could be crushing, especially for someone so young. The marriage partner would have to be strong, understanding, willing to share responsibilities, a strong provider economically if the marriage were to succeed. <clears throat>